Hey guys, Mr. Klein here with our next lesson on uh, energy, whether we're talking about kinetic or potential energy. In this lesson, we're going to be talking about potential energy, and where else should we start talking about potential energy than potential professional athletes? So let's go ahead and get started. Now, when it's time for the annual draft in professional sports, experts tend to talk about a player's potential and all the ways they can be a star player. Because, I mean, after all, it takes one thing to be a star in college. However, it does take something else to become a star at the professional level. Potential is of no use unless you can actually put it into action. But potential is something important to talk about. So just like how athletes have the potential to become better when given a new challenge or opportunity, energy has the similar potential to be released when it's stored by an object. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. The energy that is stored in an object based on its position or shape is what we call potential energy. If you remember in our last lesson, we talked about kinetic energy, which is the energy of motion. Here we're talking about energy that's stored. So let's go ahead and let's get started with an organizer. And let's go ahead and write this in, potential energy. That's what this lesson is going to be talking about. And in our next section, what we're going to be talking about is the kind of potential energy we usually think of whenever we talk about this term and that is gravitational potential energy. So when someone usually gives a simple example of potential energy or when you hear the word potential energy what you usually think of is you're actually referring to gravitational potential energy or the energy stored in an object due to the distance between it and a source of gravity. In our everyday lives we consider gravitational potential energy to be stored in an object when it's kept above the ground or above a surface or something like that. Okay and so what happens is when the object is falling like we'll see that it's potential Potential energy is turned into kinetic energy by gravity pulling it down, just like this bouncing bomb right here. Okay, it falls because gravity is pulling it down. Now, the potential energy it had was dependent on how high it was above the ground in the airplane. When the mosquito fighter bomber dropped it right here, as you can see, the gravitational potential energy turned into kinetic energy. It bounces up, that becomes gravitational potential energy and as it comes down it transfers back. So let's go ahead and let's fill out our graphic organizer and let's put this part. So there's two forms of potential energy, gravitational potential energy and then there's one we're going to discuss later. But before we get to that, in our next section what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how you can actually calculate gravitational potential energy and that's where we'll be going from here. Okay, so calculating gravitational potential energy is actually pretty easy. In fact, it's even simpler than it is for calculating kinetic energy. We use the formula PE equals MGH, or potential energy equals mass times gravity times height. And let's go ahead and try a sample problem so you can see what we're talking about here. So Briley, okay, she's holding a four kilogram box two meters above the ground. How much gravitational potential energy does the box have? Well, what we do, first thing we're going to do is we're going to write out our formula. Potential energy equals mass times gravity times height. Once we do that, we're going to substitute the words, potential energy, obviously that's our answer we're going to end up with, but we're going to substitute everything on the other side of the equation, mass, gravity, and height. Okay, so what we're going to do is we'll put in the mass, which is 4 kilograms, the height, 2 meters, and gravity. Now the gravitational pull on Earth is 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay, so we put all these in, and then remember, follow order of operations, multiply to three of them, and with that you get the answer of 78.4 joules. So that box that Briley's holding, the 4 kilogram box, 2 meters above the ground, has 78.4 joules. If you're wondering about this 9.8 meters per second squared. Well, normally whenever we determine gravitational potential energy, we're going to use 9.8 meters per second squared because that's the amount of gravity that pulls on us on the planet. However, that number does change depending on the amount of gravitational pull. For instance, there's less gravity on the moon, therefore that number would be less. If you're going to, for example, try using gravitational potential energy on Jupiter, it would be greater because Jupiter has a greater amount of gravity. So let's go ahead and Let's fill in our organizer right here. Okay, in this triangle, we're going to put the formula PE equals MGH. And then with this, in our next section, we're going to talk about the other type of potential energy, which is elastic potential energy. 
Okay, so elastic potential energy is the energy that's stored in an object depending on the object's shape. Now that's not talking about shape as in it's in a square or a circle, rather how it's being pulled or pushed together by forces. Now generally we consider elastic potential energy and how it depends on two different factors. The first one is if the object can be squeezed together. Okay, then the elastic potential energy depends on the amount the object can be compressed. For example, like a spring being squeezed together, okay? As you can see, a hot dog getting sliced in half by a mousetrap. The spring is the where the compression is going on. Whenever you pull back the mousetrap, the energy is stored in that spring. When it lets go, the mousetrap actually flies over. Then whenever we talk about a ball, if it bounces, as you can see right here, Whenever the ball hits the wall, it actually compresses, okay? So that's some elastic potential energy. As it's hitting the ground, it's compressing, and then when it bounces off, it lets go, and that energy is released. So let's go ahead and let's fill out this part of our graphic organizer, and let's talk about compression, okay? That's one way you can uh, have elastic potential energy. Well, the other one is if you can stretch it out. The elastic potential energy depends on the tension or the amount of stretching that the object is put under. For example, a rubber band being pulled, you know, like dude perfect which, you know, pulls things and does things like that up to 11. Look at that basketball go. Okay, look at that gravitational potential energy turning into kinetic energy and off the backboard and nothing but net. Okay, so as the rubber band is being pulled backwards, more and more tension is being added to it and it stores more potential energy in order to be used later when the basketball is in flight. So let's go ahead and let's finish up our graphic organizer for this section, and we're going to write in tension. Okay, so this is kind of it about potential energy, but we have one more section, which is a question you've always wondered. How exactly does potential energy turn into kinetic energy? And that's what we'll talk about in our next section. Now, oftentimes, we discuss kinetic and potential energy and its conversion, you know, you got to turn this potential energy into kinetic energy. But the problem is we rarely discuss exactly how this actual conversion takes place. We just know it changes, but how exactly it works. Well, generally, energy transfer occurs when there's an interaction of forces in some kind, okay, on two or more objects where the net force does not equal zero, which is really important. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to look at two instances where these forces can interact, in which we actually can see them in this Newton's cradle right here. Okay, as it goes in a slow motion, we see some contact and then some not contact when the object is moving and changing directions, all of which require energy. So let's go ahead and let's talk about this. The first one is direct interaction, which as you can guess, occurs when two objects touch each other. Now when this occurs, the object with the greater force transfers its energy to the object with the lesser force. As we can see with this slap shot, the greater force is the hockey stick, the one with less force is the hockey puck sitting there. Okay, so when the slap shot makes contact with the puck, the energy, kinetic energy of the hockey stick is transferred to the hockey puck and as a result, it moves. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's add that to our organizer. So energy can transfer between objects through direct contact, okay? So as the hockey puck changed from having potential energy of just sitting there to kinetic energy of it being in motion. Now the other one is indirect interaction, which if you can guess direct interactions when it touches, objects don't interact with each other without touching. In other words, they interact with out touching. Now this usually occurs when you have force fields, like not like force fields like science fiction, but rather gravity fields, electromagnetic fields, things like that. They're applied to objects. And the thing to know is that the rate of conversion from potential to kinetic energy increases the closer the objects come to each other. Much like a roller coaster speeds up as it goes downward, okay? So as it goes upward, it collects gravitational potential energy, and then as it goes down, because it's going closer to the object, being the Earth, which is the source of the gravitational pull, the faster it turns from potential to kinetic energy. The same thing occurs with a pendulum, okay? As it swings side by side in a nice, smooth motion, okay? The more it goes up, it gathers the uh, gravitational potential energy. Whenever it reaches the highest point, it then begins transferring that into kinetic energy as it goes down and it gets closer to the Earth. So let's go ahead and let's fill in our final part of our graphic organizer of indirect contact, and let's go over this. Potential energy, it's energy that's stored. It can be stored by it being above a surface, and that's gravitational potential energy, or it could be stored in the shape of it, whether it's compression and 
and it's squeezed together or tension where it's pulled apart. Now potential energy is useful because you can change in the kinetic energy. You can do, do so through direct contact when two objects touch or through indirect contact when you deal with force fields like gravity or electromagnetic forces and things like that. So there you go. That's the lesson. I hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned something or two. And if as always you have any questions, please let me know and thanks for watching.